forward slash digital trust report 2021 to download it now. Hello and welcome to episode number 28 of 11FS Spotlight. I'm Melissa Stringer. In this weekly show, we shine a spotlight on the best and the brightest in the tech and financial services industry to try and understand what gets them growing, going and what they think of the future of the industry. A big part of this show is your involvement and your questions, so please leave them in the comment sidebar and we can answer them live for you today. So on today's Spotlight, I'm delighted to be joined by Asia Bradley and Donald Hawkins, co-founders of First Boulevard. Hi guys, how are you doing? Good morning, all great here. How are you? Very well, thank you. Very excited to have you and Donald on the show. Donald, what about you? How's it going? I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. Uh, I got a lot going on right now. Eight year old and eight month old. So uh, yeah, wow. this is the best I can do. <laughs> yeah, we were talking just before the show. Um, so Asia has a four year old um, son with a tick bite and uh, Donald has got um, two children as well. So I was saying it's uh, really amazing to meet two co-founders that are absolutely <laughs> crushing it, but also have this sort of fam family responsibility as well. Um, so I guess we'll we'll be talking about all of that. Um, but mainly today, we want to be talking about uh, First Boulevard and the wealth gap in the US. So big topics, along with how amazing Asiera and uh, and Donald are, obviously. <laughs> so uh, I guess to start off, um, can you guys give us a one minute elevator pitch um, for First Boulevard? Because obviously we know your story. Um, they've been on podcast as well, guys. Um, so we're definitely worth listening out for for that. Um, but I think for the for the listeners that are new to First Boulevard would be really interesting to hear about the kind of conception and your story. Yeah, say like a, a quick elevator pitch for us is that simply we're a neo bank focused on building generational wealth in the black community. Uh, there have been a lot of things that have happened in our world over the last year and many generations before that. And black America has been in a situation in a position where we've been blocked systemically from understanding how money works uh, in this country. And as a result, you know, those persistent and cyclical issues lead to us protesting and fighting the same things generation after generation. So I see and I did a little digging and saw other oppressed communities using financial platforms as a way out of their oppression. Um, and both of those examples led to what is now the number one commercial bank in the world and the number two investment bank in the world. Uh, and Black America desperately needs a, a financial platform uh, to benefit it directly. And that's what we're aiming to solve. Amazing. I think that's an absolutely incredible mission. Um, and of course, so many people agree with you. Um, I think you mentioned before the show that you have 200,000 people on the waiting list. So it's really, really impressive. Yeah, just over 200,000. Uh, we had some amazing people join right before the show. <laughs> that was me. Um, great. So can you also tell us about, um, you know, the, the journey of starting First Boulevard and the process that you that you guys have been through and uh, and your, your personal journeys as well it would be great. Kick us off, Asia. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, for, for both of us, Donald and I, we're both serial entrepreneurs. Uh, I myself, I'm an immigrant um, to the U.S., so I was actually born in South Asia, in Pakistan specifically. Um, I'm one of those girl children that never got registered at birth. Um, so the family essentially had to decide, do we spend the money on the registration um, when she potentially might not even survive? Um, mm -hmm. And so they were kind of like, let's just not bother registering her. She's not going to go to school. She's not going to you know, get a job. She's just going to get married and have kids. Luckily, my parents had the foresight to leave um, South Asia and move to Canada. Um, and so I was educated there, spent some time at Cisco Systems at the EMEA headquarters, so in Amsterdam, um, and then spent some time in, um, in Africa, in the Middle East, um, in Egypt. Uh, and then the revolution started there, and I realized I needed to get out of there um, and get back to the United States. Uh, once I got here, um, got back into tech again um, and was the founding team at Synapse Financial Technologies, which was one of the OGs in the banking as a service spaces. Um, and through there, it was really great because I got to launch or help launch 
hundreds of different fintechs and it was really exciting. So household names like Kraken, Abra, Dave, um, but really cool stuff. Um, and then, you know, George Floyd happened. And so you kind of think, gosh, I'm, I'm just sort of going through the motions, living my life, but then am I really making an impact on this world? Am I really trying to leave this place a better place than, than where I found it? Um, and that's been sort of a recurring theme in my life of trying to find ways that I can impact the world in a positive way. Uh, and so when, when the murder of George Floyd happened and he called out to his mom, I recall like just feeling something very internally and kind of thinking the world has changed for me. Um, We've got three sons at home. So apart from, you know, tick bite son, we've got two others. And, and quite honestly, like I kind of saw George Floyd and I thought that could easily be my boy. You know, that could be my baby over there. Um, and, and I realized I needed to do something and reached out to Donald at that time and was like, hey, Donald, like, what do you think? He, he I, I think he managed to get out the words like I have an idea. And I was like, I'm in. I'm done. That's it. Um, and, and I remember I just, like, you know, quit my day job right then and there. And I was like, I'm, I'm doing this. So. I'll hand it off to Donald from that point. Love hearing Nasia's backstory. Y'all have only gotten like an eighth of it though. Uh, my uh, backstory, pretty simple. Uh, I grew up in a small little city uh, in South Georgia called Albany, about three hours south of Atlanta, uh, middle-class household. Uh, mom and dad always kept clothes on our back, food in our bellies as well. And uh, I also like people to know, you know, that a lot of black Americans are not too far removed from some pretty tough situations. So my father was the first person to integrate his high school and my grandmother grew up as a sharecropper. Right. You know, and I grew up with a chip on my shoulder because I felt privileged uh, that I was able to grow up in the household that I did while so many people that look like me, even external family members, struggled so much. Just never made sense, you know, that childlike wonder of just, you know, frustration. Why, why are things the way they are? So uh, when I was 12 years old, got really fortunate and got connected to uh, an amazing mentor who introduced me to technology. A uh, very unique journey for him to even, you know, uh, end up in my hometown. And uh, I got the bug early. I think bugs and ticks are like a recurring theme now. I'm going to try to stay away from it. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, so many years passed. I go through a couple of different ventures. Some did well, some did horrible. And I end up in the fintech industry and I felt great about it because I was building software solutions for community banks and credit unions to help them better understand their existing and prospective customers. So I felt working with those smaller institutions, I was helping local people and local banks compete against the larger incumbent banks. And 2020 happens. My wife and I find out in January of last year that we're pregnant with our second child. COVID-19, virtual education, murder hornets, political strife, and George Floyd. And for the first time in my life, I started looking at the plight that Black America was going through from the lens of an entrepreneur, as opposed to just a frustrated citizen, right? And similar to Asia, I realized that I was also in this cycle. Uh, but fortunately, COVID-19 took away the normality of us being able to just forget about how bad things are as long as we can get to brunch on the weekend. And I uh, started thinking about the plight of Black America, uh, you know, as a pain point and really saw that a financial platform and financial services specifically set up to help uh, an oppressed group of people could be a, a very viable solution. And Asia reached out and I was like, Asia, we got to do this thing. And and here we are now, less than a year later. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, um, I think there's so there's so much depth and there's so many angles um, to, to talk about with both of your stories. But what I'm hearing is that you both have this amazing, um, you know, technology background and um, credibility in terms of entrepreneurship and um, this space, this neobank space. But you also have this radical empathy and feel this responsibility to really change people's lives, which is really unique. And um, yeah, I think it's uh, ma magnetic, actually. I think um, it's yeah, testament to your humanity. But yeah, I'm always uh, really impressed and really affected whenever I talk to you guys. So yeah, loving it. Thank you. Um, so when when we're talking about First Boulevard, um, it would be really interesting to know 
the types of demographics that you're looking to um, to help, who you want to attract to your platform, um, and uh, if you're popular with a specific age range. So do you think it's sort of young people that might be feeling similar to you guys, might have had, uh, you know, parents particularly who've had a really bad time? Um, who's your target demographic, would you say? So we actually very early on did a lot of customer discovery. You know, as, as we mentioned, we've got this huge wait list. And so we thought, let's reach out to our customers, our potential customers, and kind of find out who they are. Um, and, and just sort of started doing a lot of surveys, a lot of, um, you know, interviews with them. And what we discovered was that, um, you know, our, our customer is, is in her like late 20s to late 30s. Um, someone who's very well educated. So, you know, the black community, brown communities, we're constantly being told that you need to be educated. You need to get your master's degree or PhD if you can. Um, and which, by the way, only gets us equal salary to a white high school dropout, by the way. Oh so I, I, tweeted wow. about, I tweeted about that last night. I know that for oh sure. God. So yeah, it's crazy. So so we're kind of taught like, hey, you've got to go out and get your master's, get your PhD, you know, become equals. And then you're like, womp womp, I only earn as much as a white high school graduate. But anyway, so so we've given her a name. Her name is Nia. So she's one of our, our one of our personas that we're serving. Um, obviously, we're an all inclusive, uh, you know, neobank. So anyone is welcome to join. Allies are absolutely welcome to join. What we say is we're culturally black. And so what that means is that we're looking at the very specific needs of our community and building for those needs. So the features that we've built out are specific to those. Um, so as I was talking about Nia, you know, she's probably got a bunch of student loan debt because you know, our communities also generally, our parents aren't able to pay for our education. Um, and so she's right now trying to manage that debt and kind of get it into a place where she can feel comfortable. Um, she's also the head of household when it comes to financials. Um, and she's got a lot of weight on her shoulders in terms of everyone kind of depending on her. Um, one of the other ways that we look at this though is rather than break it down to these kind of demographics like age, gender, um, zip code and things, we look at our customer based on where they are at within their financial journey. And so we've identified four main phases, a debtor phase, which is where most of our NIAs are. Um, then we've got the saver stage, which is where some of our secondary personas like Kyle and Maya are. They're, they're college students. They don't really have the student loan debt yet. They don't have credit card debt. And so those are the ones that you want to get into that sort of healthy financial hygiene stage where they're putting money aside. They, they're building up an emergency fund. Um, and then you've got those investor stages, which is the a little bit you know, more affluent community member that has already got you know, some emergency savings and is now looking to kind of do some investing. And then the final stage is that legacy builder, which is where we hope to kind of help Nia come along to. Um, and that's where you start building generational wealth. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, in terms of sort of building that wealth back and this sort of um, e equality, I suppose, in, in society um, and, and fixing some of those structural injustices. Um, I know that you also have a, uh, a program where you get cash back for buying black. Um, and so there are presumably a number of businesses that um, users of First Boulevard can, um, can shop at and, uh, that money then goes back into the, the community. Can you explain a little bit about that as well? Oh, and also we do have a comment, a really nice comment in the comment section uh, from Jan Willem de Bar. I hope I said that right. Um, Best, Best Boulevard, uh, First Boulevard is a great concept. Yeah, of course it is, it's, it's awesome. Um, I love the fact that allies can join too and it's not just, you know, for one demographic. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, uh, our cash back for buying black feature was really born out of that customer discovery, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't realize that they can start building wealth because we inundate, you know, our communities with, you know, the lifestyles of the rich and famous and Tesla and Yeezys and you got to have all these things, but we never really show people a, a path to get to that point. Right. So what happens is we see a lot of people uh, with an interest in trying to find ways to skip you know, steps and, and, and invest uh, in things that they don't know anything about, you know, or, you know, go after side hustles that, that may or may not work out. 
So some of the early discussions that we had with customers, they simply told us many of them, hey, I don't have enough money to invest. So we took that uh, information internally and was like, great, what can tech do to not only help that customer, but also help the community? As a company, one of our primary focal points is helping the black community keep money in the community. We have to circulate our dollars better. Uh, uh, right now, less than 2% of the $1.5 trillion that we spend every year stay in our community. And the average dollar only stays in the community for six hours compared to 20 days mm -hmm. in Caucasian communities. Right. So cash back for buying block is a simple piece of technology that that allows our members to earn up to 15 percent cash back when they spend money uh, at select participating black owned businesses. So by doing so, they're making the regular purchase they would normally make at a coffee shop, a bakery, a salon uh, as well, supporting that business. And then supporting that business now also creates more jobs, creates more opportunities uh, within the community. But by doing so, that person also benefits themselves. Uh, from those cash back rewards that they can then use within our platform uh, to buy down on debt, to micro invest, to acquire cryptocurrency. Uh, so the simple things that that can be done, the intention has to be there. So you mentioned earlier about what we're doing and, and how good it is as a fit for our community. And, you know, Asi and I say this pretty consistently, what we're doing could have been done before. Right. But someone has to have the intention to help, you know, an oppressed group of people aside from just bank fees. Right. But I think the prevailing thought, you know, in the industry is black America is just really good for bank fees. You know, why worry about wealth building when we can make so much money from other ways? Yeah, it was 30 billion dollars in overdraft fees were collected by banks in 2020 alone. So in the middle of a pandemic, as people were cash strapped, not being able to get jobs, the banks, the incumbent banks pulled in $30 billion. So there's absolutely zero incentive for the bank industry to reform itself to serve the customers that it's purporting to serve. You know, and, and, and you know, Donald, further building on what you just said, like representation matters. You know, we, we are a company that is predominantly BIPOC, BIPOC. Like our leadership team is I think it's like now, what is it? 60% black, 60% female, 100% BIPOC. Um, you know, and we've done this very intentionally and it wasn't very difficult to do. Like it wasn't one of those things where we struggled to find talent. We just removed racist glasses and kind of just went out and hired people based on talent, like true meritocracy, not this fake meritocracy that you hear about all the time. I'm getting feisty, you better stop me now. <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you're, you're, you're oh absolutely right. And um, I think, yeah, true, true, true meritocracy is exactly is exactly it. And um, I think that's probably you know one of the unique and amazing things that First Boulevard is um, is is doing differently as well. There's not this sort of um, you know nepotism that we see sometimes in uh, you know especially financial services world. Um, yeah, I think yeah, your your hiring practices are are really interesting and really positive. And of course, if you can do it and be so successful, it's sort of like why is you know <laughs> why is everybody else not doing this? Um, yeah. So, can you tell us a little bit more about um, the the other ways that you think uh, first first Boulevard is um, different? What you guys are doing differently? Um, I think you you mentioned sometimes that you're. Um, uh, unapologetic about banking like what what does that mean i think for us that really just ties into Aussie's earlier message around representation right in the the fintech and neobank industry you know we we see a focus on some the henry's right and then there's yeah. uh, affinity markets and then there's this very vague underserved community uh in america uh that that is faceless uh as well and, and what we found is that the reason Black America uh, is in the situation that it's in is because one, you know, a lot of the incumbent banks haven't done anything to, to help Black America. There also have been a number of other systemic things, you know, like financial education being taken out of schools in America and being replaced with things like, I don't know, trigonometry, which I haven't used since the 10th grade. Sorry, Ms. Grinsman. Uh, but, <laughs> but the way we look at it is that we want people to feel comfortable knowing that we are specifically set up and building and working and putting in all the effort and energy to serve them 
right? You know, when you look at uh, the true problems in our world, a lot of it is due to lack of representation. You know, it's primarily all white boards, primarily all middle-aged white men that send out surveys, right, to, to minority communities to figure out how we operate and then provide us products that normally don't work and keep us in the same situation. So uh, we're unapologetic about our stance. You know, we've had people ask all the time, hey, well, you know, you could have a much larger TAM if you just add Latin America or if you just add this other uh, group. And I'm like, well, we don't want to add additional groups until we have true solutions that can help people. Right. We, we named ourselves First Boulevard because Boulevard, by definition, means wide street. You know, there's room for everybody. So mm -hmm. we feel as we continue to scale and grow our company, there will be other uh, oppressed groups uh, and demos that we can also add as we build features to support them as well. But uh, it's just something special about being able to look at something and from the comments that we receive from a lot of our customers at how proud they are that we are open and unapologetic about wanting to help them. There's nothing wrong with that. No, I, I completely agree, um, and I'm sure you must have a lot of, um, you know, allies that um, that want to help but don't really know how to. Um, well, I was speaking to Asia on the um, podcast a few months back um, about George Floyd, and I think everybody was um, tremendously af affected by that. But other than you know, speaking to your um, friends about it, educating yourself, reading about it. It's sort of the problem seems too big for most people to do anything about really, um, except to, of course, educate themselves. Um, so that the fact that you are also open to allies, I think, is really positive. Um, and I'm sure that you'll get lots of, um, you know, people from other tribes wanting to get an account with you guys. And that would be awesome. Honestly, it would be really great. You know, what, what we're unapologetic about is is the culture that we're building, mm -hmm. you know, the culture of inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, building on, on our team composition, for example, even further, you know, our, our team consists of so many of these Nias and Kyles and Mayas. Um, and so they know exactly who they're building for. And we're not apologetic about that. You know, um, what we're finding right now, for example, is that the incumbent banks, you know, are, are, are gaining something from, from these customers, um, but they're not giving back the service or the type of product that they really deserve. And then if you look at the neobanks as well, and I'm coming after you all too, is that the neobanks you know, are predominantly you know, seeing serving a customer base that is very similar to who we're going after. But what's happening is that you've got Nia on their platform. You know, she's going in there for the early direct deposit. She's trying to use these budgeting tools. But then all of the messaging that's coming to her is really targeted to Zoe, right? And, and everything that's marketed is marketed to Chloe. Mm -hmm. and, and Nia's sitting here going like, I'm not out there buying avocado toast every day. I'm not out there at Star you know, Starbucks every day. So right. stop telling me to stop doing that to make my money. Yes, you know, and so, yeah, it's so really like, And then the only time that they reach out and try to make a connection with the black community is when they sign a basketball star to be an investor or they bring on a rapper and then they're like, hey, do a commercial for us. And it's like, Nia doesn't care about that stuff. Nia's a smart yeah. woman. She wants to build generational wealth. She wants mm -hmm. to take care of her family. She wants to take care of her community. So it's like, just stop patronizing us and like actually serve us the way we deserve. No, yeah, Melissa, yeah. why'd we have to go and get osteo-triggered? Come on now. Like, she's, <laughs> no, she's, I love it. She's going to so get aggressive. No, it's good. It fires me up. It, it kind of reminds us all that we're alive. You know, it's like you have to be passionate about what you're, you know, the problem that you're solving and the work that you do. I, I love it so much. Um, so, so right on your point there, Asia, the sort of um, the racial wealth wealth gap and um, trying to now create generational wealth. Um, how do you think businesses and um, other players in financial services can be a bit more empathetic about that? Because I think you know at the beginning of the show we were talking about how um, during the um, the pandemic and during the financial crash, there's all sorts of issues with like losing your job or um, choices that people make in order to support family members and they maybe don't have that um, you know preceding generational wealth that can act as a buffer. Um, so I'm imagining, um, and I know that you've spoken about this before, but there's all sorts of things around, um, you know, 
credit checks and um, not fitting into a certain uh, a certain box. What what do you think other financial institutions can do about that? I mean, you can start with transparency of fees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think that's super important. Um, transparency of fees. Be really, um, you know outright honest about what it is that you really want to do for this customer um, and let the customer be then the decision maker in terms of where they go you know but um, right now and i think i mentioned this during the podcast if you walk into a predominantly white neighborhood your minimum balance requirement is going to be about 240 dollars higher than if you were to walk into you know a, the same bank in a predominantly white neighborhood yeah. and this is allowed so so number two take racism out of the equation, like stop penalizing people, you know, that live in predominantly black and brown neighborhoods um, just for that. I mean, sure, you might say it has nothing to do with race, but you know, the outcome is that even if you're not, you know, going out to do this. So be really, you know, mindful of the impact that your decisions and your policies have. The other thing is KYC wise, be truly inclusive. You know, I still fail KYC. There are new banks out there that cannot serve me, you know, and I'm a, I'm a fintech founder and I get rejected for KYC all the time. Um, and so these are things that, you know, keep, um, you know, women, keep black people, keep brown people, keep young people, keep LGBTQ people. Imagine if you're trans and you're trying to register with your, you know, your new name and you have to sign up with your dead name. You know, these are the kinds of little microaggressions and micro traumas that our communities go through every single day. So I would say, you know, bring empathy back into the world. Mm. Yeah, I um, I totally agree. And you're so right about the LGBTQ um, challenges as, as well. Um, yeah, and the naming thing I think has come up a few times on on the um, the podcast, but it's so, it's so like dehumanizing to not go by your uh, the name that you that you feel is your you know given given name. Um, right. So I also want to ask you about um, allies. So what can what steps can allies take to support and contribute to positive change? Um, what what can everyday people do? I think there are a number of things that people can do. I mean, starting with what Asia just ended with, which is, you know, empathy, right? You know, there are a lot of performative actions that are happening right now in the U.S. You know, a lot of checks being written, you know, so that somebody can say, great, we got out of 2020 and we can say that we did X to support the black community. But a lot of these things really aren't moving the needle. Um, you know, black America is, is in a very difficult situation. Right. By 2053, the net median income of black families in the U.S. will fall to zero. Right. That's where things are headed. You know, so anything that is not focused on helping black America acquire wealth, build wealth, like needs to be a full stop. Right. That, that's where the focus needs to be. So when you see people that are struggling, you know, and you, you hear their pain. Simply be empathetic, understand where they're coming from. If you're a, a resource, a company, uh, a philanthropist that you want to help out, you know, find impactful ways that you can help transfer wealth, you know, to people. Uh, I think a lot about the funds that were recently written uh, in 2020 to a lot of HBCUs. That was amazing. You know, that helps on the education front. But outside of those universities and colleges, it's a really difficult thing for those funds to trickle down to the local community. You know, instead, you know, think about using those funds to help fund Roth accounts, you know, for a thousand black kids. Right. Think about using those funds, you know, to, to be used in ways that can help people acquire and build wealth. First Boulevard, you know, the funds that we generate from our revenue, you know, a lot of those funds are going back into the community, you know, or reinvested in the company with other features that we're developing uh, as well. There is no go-to credit card company for Black America. There's no go-to home loan, no go-to auto loan company for Black America. You know, we spend a lot of money, but we don't really have any other companies that have that specific focus on helping us get to some level of financial parity. So mm -hmm. we welcome that loss because again, the, their, the revenue that we're able to generate is something that we're going to reinvest right back into the community. Got it. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. Um, I know that we are coming out to the end of the show, so I'll be super quick. Um, but uh, Katrai um, said, are you live across the US? And is the expectation that First Boulevard should become the primary bank for its customers? 
We're not live yet. Uh, we'll be launching in about 50 days. Uh, and 100 percent, of course, you can't be in the neo bank game if you don't want to become the top uh, card in their wallet. I Definitely agree. the goal. Yeah, for sure. OK, next question is um, from uh, Sharid A. Can other fintechs do anything to help? Um, I mean, I don't really know. I'm not sure if other fintechs can do anything to help. Yeah. I mean, can they? There, there are lots of fintechs that we partner with, you know, um, that are, again, you know, enabling a lot of innovation in the fintech space. So partners, um, well, I mean, Visa, I think you can count, count them as a fintech, um, but Visa is a very strong partner of ours. Through them, we've got the crypto API, so we'll be, we'll be the sole pilot um, for their crypto APIs coming up with Anchorage. Um, we're working with Drive Wealth on the micro-investing piece. We work with Galileo on the back end. Oh, yeah. um, we've got Sponsor Bank. So there, there are a whole bunch of fintechs that can actually help. So if there are ways that you think hey, this is a way that you can launch a really awesome feature, reach out to us. Nice. Okay. Well, yeah, you heard it here first. Um, all right. So just before we finish off, um, is there anything that we didn't cover that you want to say? And can you tell us what is next for First Boulevard? I'm guessing it's your amazing launch. Well, we missed Asia. I think we covered a lot on this call. Project Tassels with Terrence oh, Day. Terrence J is one of our strategic advisors um, for financial education and HBCU outreach. He just won an Oscar for um, for Two Distant Strangers film. And so if you haven't watched it, please go watch it. It's incredible. I remember watching it and again, just thinking like, gosh, I need, I need a couple of days now to process what I just mm -hmm. watched. Um, but that was incredible. But he actually is, um, he's been really just integral for our, um, uh, project hassles, which is we're planning to pay off um, the student debts and fees um, for a thousand HBCU students. And I don't know if you've heard of stranded credits, but what it means is like these students have completed all their academic requirements, but because they broke a few too many beakers in lab class or they parked in the wrong place or they have overdue books, they their, their degrees are being held ransom. Wow, <laughs> and so, so like, well, it's crazy because, you know, we know that once you get the degree over a lifetime, you can earn a an, million dollars extra. And so right. what we're hoping to do is inject that one billion dollars back into the black community. So that's one thing. Um, Opal Tometi has also joined us as an advisor for civic engagement and civic advocacy. So we'll be coming out with some special projects that we're launching with her as well. What else, Donald? Juneteenth is our launch day. Juneteenth. It's a big one. It's a very specific date. The date that Black America claimed uh, ownership of when we got free, not when it was ratified right. uh, as well. So really, really excited about that um, uh, as well. A lot of cool things. Definitely. Yeah. And this has been one of the most exciting um, conversations that I've, I've ever had at 11FS. So thank you both so much for joining us. Um, we're coming to the end of the show. Um, can you tell us where we can find out more about you? Um, obviously the, the website, but if there's any sort of social um, media sites that you can direct people to as well, that would be great. Yeah, we're definitely uh, on all the socials, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram. Check us out under uh, Bank Boulevard, Bank BLBD, uh, or First Boulevard uh, as well. Lots of interesting things going on there uh, as well. And we also have uh, a couple of new things uh, coming to bear very soon, too, on the content side of things. We really want to make sure that we are a, a holistic company that supports our members and allies in a number of different ways. So uh, stay tuned. Awesome. Um, just one final thought from me on that. Um, you mentioned when, whenever we talk, you have all of these um, amazing facts. And um, I don't know if there's a way other than like Googling these things, how people can access that. But um, all of the different KPIs and sp especially around, you know, how long money stays in a certain um, like system or place or demographic for how long and um, primary, secondary, tertiary markets i find all of that stuff fascinating so i mean that's some great content um if you, if you guys need help with any of that um cool well that's all we've got time for this week um, make sure that you follow 11fs on linkedin so you never miss an episode and go to the 11fs youtube channel where you can catch up on all of the previous episodes 
Thank you so much, everybody, um, and Asia um, and Donald. Thank you. It's been awesome. Goodbye. You, Mel. Awesome. See you again.